Hey there, I'm Crystal, and today I want to share with you a little bit more about how to mix your in-ear monitors. Last week, I was involved in giving a little bit of a presentation on this topic to the musicians and singers at my church. And after I posted a photo on my Instagram stories about that workshop, I had quite a handful of people DM me asking me for a recording of the talk or if they could have the materials to share with their teams as well. And it wasn't recorded, but I figured if there are a couple people asking about this and wanting to know more about mixing their in-ear monitors, then there must be more of you out there who could benefit from hearing a bit more on this topic. So I decided I would just shoot a little YouTube video about this for all of you. The presentation I did for my team was a little bit more specific to the monitor mix system that we use in my church, which is the Allen & Heath ME1. But for this video, I'm just going to keep it to very general principles about mixing your in-ears that will be applicable to whatever personal monitor mix system that you are using at either your church or the venue that your band plays in, whether it's a jamming studio or any other live music venue. The topic of mixing your in-ears is something that I have literally never heard anyone really talk about. It seems to be quite overlooked, but I think it's really important for us to know how to get a good mix as musicians. That's for the simple reason that what you hear is going to affect what you play. If we think about music as a language, we could take the analogy of a really talented speaker, someone who has great command of the language, very convincing, but there's no way they're going to win an argument if they can't hear what the other person is saying. Anything they reply is just going to feel out of context and not linking to what someone is saying because they couldn't hear what that person was actually trying to communicate. And that doesn't say anything about the skills of the person who, in our hypothetical situation, is a really good speaker and really persuasive. If they can't hear what's going on in the context of the conversation, all those skills are not going to be very useful. So when we bring that analogy into our music teams, it's kind of the same. No matter what skill level we're at, if we can't clearly hear what the rest of the band is doing, anything we play is not going to be as good a fit as it could have been. And that's basically why knowing how to give yourself a good in-ear monitor mix is so important, especially in situations like for my church, where a lot of what we play is improvised music, we don't actually have a rehearsal on another day of the week to tighten up arrangements and decide who's doing what. Even if you do have a separate rehearsal session, churches tend to have weekly services, so you probably only have maybe one other rehearsal before the service, and that's not usually enough time to really lock down every single thing that's happening in the songs. For my church, we only usually plan out the first maybe three songs or so, even then, the arrangement is not 100% fixed. We might do a quiet chorus at one point or a strong chorus at that same point, depending on how the flow of the service is going. So we need to be really attentive to catch cues from the worship leader and the rest of the team so that we know how to support each other in creating the music at that point of time. This might not be as critical if you have lots of rehearsals and you already know exactly, note for note, what you're supposed to be playing at every single point of time, but I'm sure there are many of you who are in a similar context where there is an improvisational element to your playing, and that's when it becomes so critical to be able to hear everyone clearly in your mix. If you can't, you end up having a bit of a delayed reaction time to anything that's happening, and it can also lead to problems like people playing the wrong chords because they couldn't hear what was being played, it could lead to people playing the wrong rhythms, again, because they couldn't hear what rhythm was being played by someone else, or they might just be out of time with each other, maybe not because their timing is bad, but just because they couldn't hear where the time was at that point of time. It's also very important for the band to be able to hear dynamic cues in the music. If the worship leader wants to go to a quieter section and they're singing in a more gentle tone of voice, but because of a muddy mix, the band was not able to hear and respond to that cue, it's going to sound a little bit messy. And there's not as much synergy in the team because you just can't hear very clearly what each member of the team is doing. I've been talking a lot about monitoring and in-ear monitors, but I haven't explained what monitors are yet. So just in case you're not sure about this concept, 
let's just talk about what monitoring is first. Basically, monitors are how musicians hear themselves in this modern day age of electronic instruments. If you're playing an acoustic instrument, the feedback that you receive from the instrument is direct. If you play a grand piano, for instance, you are just hearing the piano and the strings in the piano are resonating to create the notes and then you hear the sound. But if you're playing an electronic keyboard, if you didn't plug it into an amplifier or to headphones, you're not going to be able to hear what you're playing. In a modern band, we usually have several electronic instruments, whether it's keyboards or electric guitars and bass, and even drums are mic'd up with microphones which produce electronic signals. So in order for members of the band to be able to hear themselves as well as what each other is playing, they need some kind of monitor device that projects all that sound at them. Before in-ear monitor systems were invented, everyone pretty much used floor monitors or they're sometimes called wedges because these are those speakers that are lying about on the floors of stages pointing up at musicians. And there are definitely a lot of drawbacks to this system. For one, it tends to lead to a very loud stage. Often you would have guitar amplifiers or keyboard amplifiers on stage as well as your floor monitors and the drum set and the overall decibel level of the stage would be very high. And the ramifications of that are your vocalist mics are going to get a lot of bleed from all this sound that's happening on the stage and there's no clear signal that the vocal mics are picking up. The other downside of having a really loud stage is that all the musicians on stage are exposed to a very high decibel level for a decent period of time as long as their set is. And the longer you're exposed to high decibel levels or loud sounds, the higher your chances of hearing damage and hearing loss. And hearing damage is permanent. In those cases, if you didn't want to damage your ears, you would probably use earplugs. But then when you use earplugs, you're cutting out a lot of other frequencies and overall the sound ends up not clear at all because you're literally sticking things in your ears. So that's not a very good solution to the problem either. When you're playing with floor monitors, you also are not able to play with a click track or any backing tracks because if you play a metronome through your monitors, the audience would be able to hear it as well. And finally, you also just don't have control over your own mix. You would have to communicate to the monitor engineer if you wanted any adjustments to your mix. In my church's previous sound setup, we used to use floor monitors like over 10 years ago. And I remember that it was so difficult to get a clear mix. And if I needed any volume changes during the service set, I would have to kind of wave frantically at the sound guy and hope that I would get their attention and then try and make some hand signals like if I wanted the piano to be louder and just hope that they would understand what I was trying to say. So it was not the most efficient kind of system. On the other hand, if you have an in-ear monitor system and especially one that allows you to have a personal monitor mix, you have a lot more control over the sound output that you're getting and because you're putting the in-ear monitors in your ears, they also protect your ears from loud stage sounds. This is so important, especially for drummers, because the drums are acoustically one of the loudest instruments. And if you play them at a high volume for a long period of time, you are probably just going to damage your ears. So wearing in-ear monitors while you are performing on the drums is a great way to protect yourself. And you can also control the level of music that you're hearing so that you can hear what the rest of the band is doing while not damaging your ears. Of course, we can also play with a metronome, we can play with click tracks, we can have backing tracks if we so desire. Basically, backing tracks are other parts that have been prearranged to the music that no one is actually playing on stage, but the audience will hear it, so it can be used for special effects or maybe additional, uh, for example, synth and keyboard tracks that we don't have enough people on stage to play at that point of time. So those become options when you're using in-ear monitors. However, there is the drawback of in-ear monitors and that is the fact that they can sometimes feel very enclosed or artificial or even muddy if you don't know how to set them up properly. And the reason for that is actually how our ears and our brain works. So our brain is a really amazing organ and when we hear a sound, say if I have a sound over here, my right ear hears the sound just a little bit louder than my left ear and it also receives the sound on my right side just a little bit faster than it receives the sound on my left. And the brain takes that information 
and computes where this sound is coming from and it locates that sound in space. So as we go about our daily lives, our brain is kind of continuously making these calculations to give us an idea of the space that we're in. Now, if you just plug in your earphones to your IEM mix unit and you don't really mess with anything, chances are what you are hearing is what we call a mono signal. Now, a mono signal is literally just one signal. So when it splits to left and right, it's an identical signal on both sides. And this is a very artificial way of hearing sound because our brain is not used to hearing the same signal on left and right. As we go about our lives, we're hearing sounds around us all the time and our brain is used to functioning in these spaces where it can sort of tell where things are based on the differences between the left and right signals. But when you hear a mono mix, your brain doesn't really know what to make of that because this isn't a situation that should happen. There's no time in reality where literally everything is exactly dead straight in front of you. It's always going to be off to the side whenever there's more than one source. So when you listen to a mono signal for an extended period of time, it can cause brain fatigue and hearing fatigue, as well as a lack of clarity in a mix. The opposite of mono would be stereo, where we have a slightly different left and a slightly different right signal. And that allows our brains to locate the different elements of the mix spatially. Now, I'm just going to play for you a little clip that switches between stereo and mono, and hopefully you'll be able to hear the difference. So I would advise you to get your earphones, or if you're listening to this through speakers, it's fine. If you're on your phones, just try rotating your phone to landscape. That can give you a little bit uh, more of a stereo image, but ideally, try it with headphones. that you could hear the difference between a mono mix and a stereo mix. So a mono mix is going to sound a little bit more dull and everything just feels like it's coming from one point. Whereas when you have a stereo mix, the elements are spread out a little bit more. And this is so important when we're mixing our in-ears to give ourselves a stereo image if we want clarity between different elements in the mix. No matter what mixer you are using, generally there will be a few functions in common there's going to be your master volume, which sets your overall output of the mixer. And then you have your individual channels, which each come with their own levels. So that's the volume or the output of each instrument channel, as well as panning. Now panning is where that sound is located on the left to right continuum. So panning out different elements in your mix is going to give you a stereo image or a stereo sound. And you would also probably have a solo and mute function for each of those channels. Solo just means you only hear that one channel. Mute means you don't hear that channel. And I think those are about the few things that every single mix unit will generally have. If they are a little bit higher end, there's usually more functions, but I'm not going to go into that now. I just want to talk about some general principles that you should bear in mind when you're setting up your in-ear monitor mix. Firstly, your master volume should be somewhere in the middle. You don't want it all the way to maximum and you don't want it too low either. Uh, generally, you want to give yourself adequate headroom to turn it up if you need a little bit more volume or turn it down if suddenly things get a little bit louder in the set when everyone's a bit more excited. For your individual channel levels, you also don't want to max out any of your channels. For the system that we use, the ME1 has a little indicator where your 0 dB mark is. That should be the loudest you want anything in your mix to be at. When you go too close to the maximum limit of your level bar, that's where you run the risk of distorting the sound and clipping if you go across that maximum output limit. We were talking a lot about panning elements when we were discussing mono versus stereo, but some of you might be wondering, how do I know where to pan different instruments in my mix? I'll talk through that in a little bit more detail shortly, but a general rule of thumb for panning is that you want to pan out instruments that exist in a similar frequency range. 
So if you have a guitar and a piano that are both kind of in the mid frequency range, you might want to pan them out separately so you have more separation in those two instruments. It should go without saying that you also want to keep both of your in-ears in so that you can reap the benefits of all your panning because if you take out one side of your in-ear monitors, you're just throwing away everything that you panned right and you are leaving yourself with a mono mix on one ear. It's actually quite dangerous for your hearing to leave one in-ear monitor off and the other on because then you're having an imbalance of hearing and basically your brain does not compute this very well again and you're not going to hear as clearly on that one side as you would if you had both in. So in order to compensate, you'll feel like you need to increase the volume more and then what happens is you have one side of your ears getting blasted with a higher decibel level and overall it's again not good for your hearing health. So there may be times you need to take out an in-ear monitor, maybe to talk to someone or if you need to hear the audience response to something, but it shouldn't be the default mode for you to wear your earphones. If you need to take it out for a short while, that's fine. Just try not to make that a habit. If you really feel like it's too enclosed and you want to hear more ambience, you can look into getting ported earphones, which have a little bit of sound that they allow in so that you can hear a little bit more of the ambience around you without feeling so closed off. Alternatively, you can also look into things like getting the sound engineer to have uh, audience mics or crowd mics to give you a little bit of that ambience if that's something you feel like you need as a performer. If you're playing with a metronome or a click track, make sure that you can hear that click clearly in quieter moments, but it shouldn't be super loud. Uh, I have known some musicians who give the advice that the metronome should be the loudest thing in your mix. I think that is not very good advice because the metronome only gives you one type of information and that's timing. Whereas other elements or other instruments in the band give you so much more information about feel, where you are in the song, your dynamics, expression, and if you are taking up majority of your mix with just the constant rhythm of a metronome, you're actually missing out on a lot of that texture. The cure to someone not playing in time is not to give them a louder metronome. They just need to practice and get better time. So don't take increasing your metronome channel as a quick fix to a timing problem because you're going to miss out on so much other information that's happening in the music. And I feel that it really affects the nuances of a musician's playing if they are hearing too much metronome and not enough of the actual music. One small note about the comms mic channel. I'm sure not all of you would have a comms mic, but basically that's a microphone where the music director speaks into it to tell the band things about the music or arrangement. And that microphone is only fed to members of the band. The audience doesn't hear it. Not all of us who use a comms mic in our teams have the luxury of having a proximity sensor or a foot switch to easily turn that mic on and off, so sometimes it's just left on throughout the whole set. And if your MD doesn't speak very loud, you might be tempted to increase the volume of the comms mic channel to hear what they're saying. And then sometimes we get the problem of hearing strangely distant and echoey drums, or sometimes very harsh drums. And that can often be attributed to comms mic bleed. So bleed is when unwanted sound gets into a microphone. If that happens to you, solo the comms mic channel so you can check if that is indeed the culprit to this weird sound. And then you can tell your MD to either turn off their microphone when they're not using it or just physically shift it away from pointing at the drummer. Usually the drums will be the loudest element on stage if you're using in-ear monitors. So that is usually the thing that ends up bleeding into the comms mic. Or worse still, if your drummer has a talkback mic as well and they forget to turn it off, you might hear really loud cymbal sounds from the drummer's mic. So if you're hearing something unusual, check your comms mic channel. For this last section, we're going to talk about how I actually pan the channels in my mix. So the drum set is probably the most complicated instrument to mic up and it's going to have a lot of channels. Basically, you want to have your kick and snare in the center. 
if you are the bassist, you probably want the bass drum to be louder. For everyone else, both of them can be a similar volume. That's your main ingredient for your drum mix to give you the overall rhythm. And the next most important channels to include will be your overhead left and overhead right microphones. So if you don't know what those are, you can kind of see them back here on my kit. This is my right overhead. This is my left overhead because my drum set is facing that way in my room. And what those microphones do is they pick up an overall audio image of the drums kind of from the top. So you would want to pan the overhead left microphone to the left and the overhead right microphone channel to the right. That way you'll have a wider stereo image of the drums and you won't have the feeling like all the cymbal sounds are right smack in the center. Different drum sets have different numbers of toms, so whether you have two, three or four toms, you can pan them slightly left to slightly right. You can ask your drummer what their arrangement on the instrument is in terms of where their toms are located and roughly try to match that to your stereo imaging. If there's a hi-hat mic, that can be slightly left. If there's a right cymbal mic, that can usually be slightly right. But again, it depends on the drummer's setup. For the bass guitar, usually there is no one else to fight with the bass guitarist in the low frequency zones, so I will usually leave the bass dead center together with the bass drum. When it comes to guitars and your keyboards, it can be a little bit trickier, again, depending on how many guitarists you have, how many keyboardists you have. Usually for my church setup, we have first keys and second keys. First keys is generally a piano sound. Second keys will be more synth or more pads. And sometimes they play more lead lines. If the second keys player plays more lead parts, I will tend to pan them a little bit further out than if they played pads. If they're playing pads, I will usually leave them slightly more centralized. In general, when I'm on stage, the guitarists tend to be on my right and the pianists tend to be on my left. So if I only have one keyboardist and one guitarist, I would pan the keyboardist maybe 30% left, guitarist 30 to 50% right. Acoustic guitarist will be somewhere nearer the middle but off center. If I had two electric guitarists though, I would pan one right and one left. Same thing if I had two acoustic guitarists, I would pan one to the right and one to the left. How far you want to pan them out depends on your personal preference, but as long as you're not having two similar sounds on top of each other, uh, usually you'll have enough clarity to make out who's doing what. In terms of vocalists, generally I'll have my main vocalists maybe one 10% left and one 10% right, so they're roughly in the center of my mix, but again, not directly overlapping each other. And for any supporting singers, I will usually have them quite low in my mix, but I'll pan them out, some on the left, some on the right, just so that there is that wider sound and I don't feel like everything is bunched together dead center of my mix. The time to figure out all your levels and panning settings is actually during your sound check. Most of us think that sound check is the time for our sound person to set the mix for the band and EQ the microphones and things like that for us. But we also need to set our own mixes if you have a personal monitor mix system. So don't zone out while everyone else in the band is doing their EQ and sound check while you wait for your turn. That should be the time where you are looking into your monitor mix system and setting your levels and panning for the individual members of your band as they are doing their sound check. That's about all I have to share with you guys on some general tips for giving yourself a good in-ear monitor mix. And I highly encourage you to experiment with whatever system you have to just improve the sound you're getting. Don't feel afraid to explore and just mess around with things. As long as you're curious about something and you're trying to make it better, I'm sure that you will improve in giving yourself a clearer mix. And I also really hope that more musicians would be more attentive to other members of the band because I know a lot of musicians who don't really pay attention to what else is happening in the music and they're just really focused on their own part. But it actually is so much more rewarding when you can hear and respond to what other people are doing in the band. It does take a certain level of skill and competence on your own instrument to be able to start thinking about what other people are doing, but it is so rewarding when you can respond to what other members of your band are playing, and that synergy with the whole team is what makes it enjoyable for everyone, both members of the team as well as the audience. 
And giving yourself a good monitor mix is going to get you one step closer to that. That's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, drop a comment below if you have any other questions about in-ear monitors. And I hope you have a wonderful day. See you in the next one. Bye. I don't know. Was that weird? I feel like that was weird.